China's decision to plug loopholes in Hong Kong's electoral system has attracted criticism from some governments abroad. What's fueling the pushback? And a group of prominent journalists, filmmakers and other public figures signed an open letter calling on the UK's media regulator to reverse its broadcast ban on CGTN in the UK. What inspired them to do so and what are their arguments? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. On March the 11th, the National People's Congress, or MPC, China's top legislature, adopted a decision to make changes to the electoral system of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. The MPC said the decision was made to develop a democratic system more suited to the region's realities. However, the move has attracted criticism from other countries. The UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab issued a statement claiming that China's decision to impose radical changes changes to Hong Kong's electoral system is part of a pattern designed to harass and stifle all voices critical of China's policies. And the G7 foreign ministers and the high representative of the European Union also issued a joint statement expressing grave concerns over China's decision, claiming that it erodes democratic elements of the electoral system in Hong Kong and undermines Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy under the one country, two systems principle. Why has there been such strong pushback and what's the possible impact? Are they justifiable? Joining me from New York to discuss the topic via Skype is Danny Haifong, a journalist and the Black Agenda Report, a website dedicated to news commentary and analysis for the black left. And from Beijing, Wang Tsong, senior correspondent at the Global Times. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Now, very briefly, uh, the changes to Hong Kong's electoral system is uh, mainly on the size, composition and functions of uh, the Election Committee of Hong Kong. For instance, uh, from now on, the Election Committee will not only be charged with uh, nominating and electing the chief executive, but also the nomination of all of the legal members, um, in other words, Hong Kong's legislators, and the election committee will also be responsible for voting for some of the LegCo members. Meanwhile, the size of the LegCo will be bigger from 70 to 90, so will the size of the election committee from 1,200 to 1,500. So um, speaking to the press to explain the reasons and the details of the changes, a Chinese official, a top uh, spokesperson of the office of the Commission of the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of China in the Hong Kong SAR, emphasized that the key issue is not whether democracy and freedoms should be upheld, but about a battle against those trying to grab power and commit subversion and infiltration. Wang Tsung, um, do you agree with that statement? If so, why does that matter so much? Well, absolutely, because, I mean, we've heard uh, so much from the uh, G7 uh, and other Western countries foreign ministries expressing concerns, and they have uh, deliberately uh, exaggerated or distorted the fact. The fact is this uh, reform is going to improve uh, the uh, the election system because it has so much problem that uh, resulted in you know Hong Kong being on fire in 2019, and it actually expanded the representation uh, of the election committee. Uh, think about it: the election committee is like the electoral college in the United States. They have no problem, uh, ha you know, having such an electoral college to elect the president. Why they have uh, concerns to have uh, uh, over a uh, a reform to expand representation in Hong Kong. Uh, clearly, this is not about democracy. Uh, this is not about uh, uh, you know Hong Kong's issues. This is uh, geopolitics. This is how they trying to uh, gra uh, show their strengths and their you know uh, clinging on to their uh, dominance uh, in this uh, in in the in this in the global community because they think they're promoting democracy, but that's not the issue. Uh, at at uh, at hand, Denny, your take on the situation uh, is the changes necessary to Hong Kong's uh, electoral system about democracy, about the technicalities about democracy, or the essence of who can be in power and 
in, in whose hands will the regime of Hong Kong rest? Well, I think that Hong Kong has been used by the United States, the UK, and Western powers as this proxy for geopolitical interests, when in fact Hong Kong since 1997 has been the sovereign uh, uh, jurisdiction of China itself. And all of this talk about whether the issue of democracy is really at heart here is uh, ridiculous when we think about the fact that the basic law of Hong Kong, what's called the mini constitution in Hong Kong, calls for, in Article 23, an enactment of measures that secure Hong Kong as part of China. And this move by the NPC to strengthen the electoral system in Hong Kong only expands democracy. So this idea that the UK and others and the media have spread about this move being some sort of threat to democracy in Hong Kong is is quite frankly hypocritical. And it's also it's also quite interesting because when uh, these countries refer to the constitution of Hong Kong, they only mention the basic law. They don't mention the national constitution of the People's Republic of China, which is a factual mistake because the constitutional order of Hong Kong is not just the basic law, but uh, first and foremost, the, the constitution of the People's Republic of China as well. Danny, do you think they are uh, intentionally evading that or are they selectingly, you know, are they being selective in what they want to quote to support their argument? Well, I think that there are real geopolitical interests here from uh, the West and the United States. Uh, they have a vested interest in posing Hong Kong as separate from China because they themselves, through the National Endowment for Democracy, were supporting the separatist forces, which caused so much havoc from 2019 onward. And we can go back even to 2014. Folks like Jimmy Lai and Joshua Wong, these forces uh, directed protesters to uh, commit acts of violence, to uh, vandalize public buildings, public infrastructure, and the legislative council building itself. And, and I think uh, that is why Hong Kong is being separated from China in the public relations field and in the media, because there's a vested interest to divide China and uh, basically uh, stop this process of unification that's been going on, honestly, for over a century. Now, for the last several decades, China has been making moves to really integrate Hong Kong into the larger society, which is stipulated both in the basic law and in the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, as you said. Well, we're going we're gonna to wait for uh, the courts in Hong Kong to, de to decide exactly to what extent and, and of what nature the action of people like Jimmy Lai or Joshua Wan amount to. That's, that's for the courts to decide. But it is very clear, you know, what they stand for and what kind of influence they've had on the street movements in Hong Kong and what kind of damage they've inflicted. Um, but you mentioned something very interesting, Danny. You talked about Hong Kong being reintegrated into China and people don't seem to understand the, the importance of that. Well, despite the criticism from some Western countries, a few days ago, actually 70 countries delivered a joint statement through Belarus and representatives of over 20 countries spoke respectively at the 46th session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva in support of China's position and measures on Hong Kong-related issues and opposing other countries' interference in China's internal affairs. Compared with the G7 and the EU statement, uh, Danny, who really represent the international community? The United States and the West believe themselves to be the arbiters of what international law really is, but we are seeing on question after, after question, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's China's relationship and its policy in Xinjiang, that much of the world is actually on China's side, especially that part of the world, the global south, which has experienced what China experienced, the century of humiliation, which Hong Kong is such a key aspect of, Hong Kong being a colony of the United Kingdom uh, for so many years. The Global South, which has a very similar experience, 
shares China's position that Hong Kong is in fact the sovereign territory, a city, a region, which is in fact under the jurisdiction of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, mm. and that this is the only direction that will bring progress, not just in China, but also worldwide, because it's an example of how a country begins to really assert independence in all spheres mm -hmm. of uh, governance, economic, political, military, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, and that is what a lot of the world wishes for itself. Mm -hmm. And so the United States and the West and the media that talks about Hong Kong in this way, they're opposed to any kind of act of self-determination or any kind of assertion of independence because it means that their interests might be infringed on. Yeah. Those interests which really mean uh, putting Hong Kong under its jurisdiction and continuing this kind of foreign imposition um, in a different kind of way, which is what uh, the U.S. and the West hope for in the long run. Well, another thing that uh, these uh, Western politicians argue about uh, Hong Kong is that Hong Kong's stability and prosperity will be undermined if freedom of speech will uh, be taken away or um, that has already been taken away given the new national security law uh, for Hong Kong. But performances in the financial sector, for instance, uh, for last year, actually spoke different of the reality. We have data showing, for instance, uh, the amount of funds flowing into Hong Kong reached 50 billion US dollars and, and the, the balance of Hong Kong banking system has repeatedly hit record highs and that the amount of funds raised by Hong Kong stock IP ranked second in the world and in January this year the value of Hong Kong stock market exceeded the historical high of 50 trillion Hong Kong dollars or 6.4 trillion US dollars I mean nobody's making up these numbers I think they're open for anybody to see so why is West why are these Western countries claiming that you know measures such as the national security law in Hong Kong is undermining the stability and uh, prosperity of Hong Kong when the numbers clearly are saying the opposite Wong Song uh, you already cited the, uh, the uh, numbers and uh, we've done uh, extensive reporting on how businesses reacted to this uh, to this uh, national security law last year uh, it has only gone up uh, the your confidence because although there are still a lot of problems, including the pandemic, uh, still very serious in Hong Kong, the confidence in the, uh, predict, uh, the environment of the, uh, of the financial uh, center is still is going up, not going down. Um, also, uh, you know, you would wonder me if China wants to damage right, the stability and prosperity of Hong Kong. I don't think that's in China's interest either. But finally, Danny, Danny let me ask you this question and try to keep it keep short, because the United States House of Representatives actually just uh, passed a reform bill of the U.S. election system. Uh, what sets that apart from China's efforts to, to, you know, fix any potential problems in Hong Kong's election system? Why? You know, the U.S. is justified to do what it believes is the right thing. Nobody comes out to condemn it. China certainly doesn't. And the Western countries seem, you know, entitled to have a say when China does what it sees necessary in Hong Kong. Well, the United States and the West, uh, they have this exceptionalism that really paints a picture, a propagandistic picture, of the world whereby anything the United States and the West does is exceptional and is acceptable while countries around the world that do the very same thing are demonized when geopolitical interests are at play. And this whole framework of China, uh, especially Hong Kong, being in some kind of turmoil and chaos is all about how China right now, by moving forward with st uh, building stability in the electoral process in Hong Kong and really securing Hong Kong as a part of China goes along with this larger geopolitical reality where China's economy is growing, China has contained the pandemic, while the United States and the West are, are really facing such uh, horrific and, and earth-shattering crises domestically mm. Uh, where they need to project okay. this kind of turmoil abroad, especially when it comes to China, yeah. which it sees, and Biden has mentioned, is right now its 
primary quote unquote rival and, and counterpart which it seeks to contain. And, and I think that's really what's at heart here um, right. with the whole discussion about Hong Kong. Thank you very much. We're going to leave it there. Wang Tsung from Global Times and Denny Haifun from Black uh, Agenda Report.